defeat, no man can. Welcome back once again to Deja Review, where today I conclude my set of retrospective reviews on the Prince of Persia trilogy by discussing the final game in the series, The Two Thrones. Both The Sons of Time and Warrior Within were extremely innovative and original games at the time of their release, and I imagine it was a huge strain on the developers to keep the games moving forward in an inventive manner, given that each of the games only had a one year development cycle. I haven't gone into much detail about the development of each title, instead focusing mainly on what we got with the final product. But just before we get started with this one, it's probably wise to go over a glaring issue. The Sands of Time was universally adored when it hit the shelves in 2003, but Warrior Within seemed to split the fans right down the middle. Some players appreciated the darker tone, gruesome visuals and more complex tale of the narrative, but there's no denying that the jolting chains of aesthetics unsettled many fans of the series. Ubisoft took a huge gamble with Warrior Within, and I'm certain that they intended to finish the series off with the same oppressive tone that loomed over that game, but about halfway through developing Two Thrones they seemed to change their mind. Early gameplay trailers and preview footage shows an entirely different beast from what we ended up with. It appeared to keep all the blood and gore from its predecessor, as it had the prince leap across the overcast city of Babylon, shredding his enemies to pieces once again, as well as burning himself in fire to change into his alter ego. Of course, much of the final game was extremely similar to those early previews, but it's clear that the developers toned down the violence dramatically, taking away the dark edge that Warrior Within owned, and instead hastily trying to force things back to the way they looked in the sands of time. They even changed the name of the game, as it was originally expected to be titled Kindred Blades, which is a damn shame because that's a great name. But anyway, enough about what could have been, let's get into my thoughts and what we ended up with. Let's explore 2005's brilliant identity crisis, Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. The Two Thrones promptly picks up a few weeks after the events of Warrior Within, well, the canon events anyway. The developers must have realised that most people would have missed out on the special ending of the last game, and so added in a handy wee retcon that changes their perceptions of what happened. I remember when I first played the game in fact, and seen the opening, I had no idea what the hell was going on, and kept wondering to myself why they changed the whole story. Silly bastard that I was. Anyway, here we start with the Dahaka finally defeated, the Prince and Kylina return to Babylon, only to find that it's in the midst of a devastating war. The Prince has obviously forgotten that all the events of the Sands of Time have now been wiped from existence, so the Maharaja never found the mystical hourglass on the island of time, and the Vizier is still very much alive and desperate to find a way to become immortal again. It's made out that the Vizier accompanied the Maharaja on his trip and learned that the Empress of Time could grant him eternal life. So he's travelled to Babylon, ravaged the war, and happily awaits the prince's arrival back to his kingdom. So anyhow, the prince's boat gets destroyed yet again as he enters the harbour, and the empress is captured by a couple of the vizier's guards. The prince makes his way through the ruined city streets and eventually catches up with Kylina's abductors in his father's royal palace. It's here that we once again come face to face with that evil old bastard, although he doesn't look half as old and sickly this time round. Quite a cool wee detail was that the vizier has never met our prince before because the timeline has been wiped, so he doesn't really think much of us, whereas the vizier is basically the prince's mortal enemy by this point. He doesn't stay mortal for much longer though as he immediately kills the empress and releases the sands of time once more, infecting most of Babylon and his Scythian army. The vizier then goes on to stab himself with a dagger of time and transforms into... Eh... Uh, Listen, I've never been able to figure out what this big amber exoskeleton is actually meant to be. It's like half crab, half butterfly. But yeah, he gains immortality as our prince gets a sand infested dagger tail fused into his arm. Luckily he manages to acquire his old pal, the dagger of time, before the sand corrupts him entirely and plummets about 5,000 feet down a sheer cliff. Much of the story from here on out consists of the prince making his way through all the different sections of Babylon to once again kill the vizier at the top of a tower. This time it has to be with the dagger itself, as it's the only artifact that can abolish his immortality. As the prince journeys on, he soon realises that the infection from the sands have greatly affected his body and mind, creating an alter ego, appropriately called the Dark Prince. The Dark Prince constantly talks and taunts to the prince as he nears his goal. I can only imagine what the vizier is doing. Probably expanding his army, torturing innocent citizens, deciding what kingdom to conquer next. What he should be doing is dying. I have not forgotten my mission. Could have fooled me. 
and finds a way to completely take over his mind at certain intervals, temporarily transforming him into a hybrid sand monster with heightened abilities. This B plot, so to speak, is honestly the main hook of the game as it's captivating to witness this arrogant and sarcastic inner voice start to alter the prince's state of mind. While advancing through Babylon, we encounter our old ally, Farah, who has no knowledge of the prince and initially seems quite concerned by the fact that we know her name and official title. Before long, the team up again though, as she begins to act as a voice of reason who pulls the prince away from the cruel grasp of his alter ego and reminds him that it's not just about ending the vizier's life, but helping all the suffering citizens of the kingdom. After a long journey through Babylon, the vizier finally makes an appearance out of thin air in the Hanging Gardens, capturing Farah and plunging the prince down into an ancient well. It's at this crucial point in the game that the Dark Prince almost permanently takes over, as the prince transforms mid-fall and cannot source out any water to help him return to his normal form. The takeover is just about complete when the prince stumbles upon his father's dead body, laying alone at the bottom of this well. It's totally unclear why King Sharaman was trapped down a pitch black vault. Either the vizier trapped him down here and slaughtered him, or he's just wandered in here, fell asleep and died. Either way, it's a key moment in the story as the prince eventually comes to accept his fate, refusing to battle against the consequences of his actions any longer, and vanquishing the Dark Prince from his soul altogether. The Prince then journeys onwards and upwards until he reaches the top of the Tower of Babylon and confronts this hideous looking vizier, who's now titled himself Zorvan I think, as he thinks himself as a god. He ends up getting the better of this old prick once again, slaying him with a dagger and releasing the sands from his body. Farah is subsequently set free and the people of Babylon rejoice. Or what's left of them. The prince must lastly go through a surreal mental realm to destroy his dark alter ego once and for all. Thanks to Farah he manages to escape this place of evil, and the story ends, once again, with the prince telling Farah all about his tale, and so starting the whole story of the trilogy over again. Look, I have problems with elements of the story, but this ending is deeply effective, and the perfect way to complete this time travelling story. The story of the Two Thrones does feel like a light retread of the Sands of Time, but with a few crucial changes that stop it from getting boring. Like before, we're back in a more classic Persian setting, possess the Dagger of Time, journey with Farah, have to deal with the passing of our father and take down the big bad vizier at the end of it all. It does feel like highly familiar territory, just with the stakes raised somewhat. It's far from a carbon copy of the first game though, as it plays out more like a what if scenario, as this time the vizier has gained immortality and near destroyed the prince's own hometown. It all feels much grander than anything from the sands of time, largely thanks to the fact that you're travelling through a full city instead of an isolated palace, trying to save anyone that you come across. The biggest and best switch up is by far the inclusion of the Dark Prince in this adventure. Although we have Farah back on our side for large portions of the journey, the persistence of this inner voice and physical transformation helps stop things from ever feeling too comparable to anything we've gone through before. I think I'm going to be sick. It feels like the Dark Prince is almost a self-referential addition by the developers, as he comes across as a schizophrenic embodiment of the two different shades of our prince, split between the innocent charming nobleman of the Sands of Time and the focused battle-hardened warrior from Warrior Within. Because we have observed most of the plot beats from this story before, it would be fair to say that it is possibly the weakest in the trilogy in terms of engagement, but there can also be no denying that the internal strife conveyed within the prince's mind comes off as one of the most compelling narratives in the series. Yet again, The Two Thrones looks mostly spectacular on all platforms, especially given its age. The game has done away with the constant dark and dreary environments, instead replacing them with an array of more vibrant cityscapes and luscious gardens where the colours shine right off the screen. As I've mentioned before, it does tend to remind you of the Sands of Time more than Warrior Within, swaying back to the more dynamic colour palette and capturing the feeling of ancient Persia perfectly. Babylon was the obvious location to end the prince's adventure and it truly looks apart throughout large portions of this game. The rooftops look unbelievably expansive, the city streets lay demolished and infested with evil monsters, and the palaces we enter are marvels in terms of architecture. It's obvious that the aim was to make this the most grandiose adventure of the lot, by giving the player the freedom of an entire ravaged city to explore, and it does the job successfully, for the most part. It is hard to deny that many sections of this game all seem to merge into each other thanks to the surroundings appearing a bit, well, bland at times. I'll go on to discuss the specifics about level design later, but for every area that catches your eye and lives long in the memory, there's one that just looks like a mundane street or corridor tucked away within a dingy city. Perhaps I'm being harsh here, as these areas aren't exactly a dime a dozen, but they do tend to appear frequently enough that you're wishing the game would hurry up and get you to the next big spacious area that you can get platforming around. 
On my last playthrough there I noticed just how much of the first third of the game all blends into one another because most of the surroundings look pretty much identical. It doesn't help that there's a slightly murky golden hue over all the outdoor environments that doesn't have the same attractive allure as the Sands of Time. The game could have maybe utilised a different distinctive look when we transform into the Dark Prince perhaps to give us a visual contrast, maybe make use of a darker filter or increase the contrast to help these little segments stand out more in terms of appearance. The final thing I'll mention here is also that the in-game character models seem to look a bit off this time round, with Farah and the Prince's hair constantly cropping through their face in cutscenes and the Vizier looks like one hot fucking mess. I already feel like I'm picking in the game a bit now, but I'm going to have to get tore into the audio side of things as well while we're at it. I promise I do love this game, so the positives are on their way. Previously the music was incredibly fitting throughout both games, with the sands of time going for a healthy mix of Arabian and classy rock riffs, while Warrior Within leaned more heavily towards blaring metal screeches and creepy ambient loops. Both worked absolute wonders in emphasising their atmospheres respectively and ramping up the sense of adrenaline when the prince was locked in combat. In the two thrones, the music's okay, but I would struggle to say that it's anything more than that. Some of the early fight tracks stick in your memory, but that's primarily because they're playing so often. Probably my favourite track is this palace battle music. That's actually the only outstanding song and a soundtrack that just doesn't stand out much at all, at least when comparing it to what the previous two titles had to offer. Effective ambient music does appear in certain more mysterious levels in the game like the sewers. Anything else just seems to disguise itself as background noise and gets lost in the sounds of citizen screams from below, but that works just fine so I've no real complaints there. Thankfully, the in-game animations are as faultless as ever as the prince's moveset remains intact. It can perform just about every single action from Warrior Within, but overall just seems wildly more agile in this adventure. It's a given by now that he can do all the wall running, pole swinging and acrobatics that he's renowned for, but this time round the prince has got a whole load of new insane looking moves in his arsenal. Every new acrobatic manoeuvre fuses in so smoothly with his previous bag of tricks and you get used to all the new possibilities so quickly that it immediately looks natural to be stealthily sliding down chains and shimmying down tight spaces. You soon forget that these actions weren't even available in his previous outing. The prince also looks back to his normal self appearance wise and no longer shouts in a fit of rage every time he takes down an enemy. They did a superb job of merging his two different identities from the last games and passing him off now as someone who's soaked up all the bloodshed of the past seven years, but still retains parts of the graceful, light-hearted nature he started off with. Just like last time, I'll split the gameplay into three separate categories, as we see what's new with the combat, action platforming and puzzle solving, and discuss whether the new additions were warranted. The core combat won't take all that long to discuss anyway, because it's damn near identical to what we had in Warrior Within, and I'm just fine with that. The freeform fighting system was a bloody glorious way of taking down your enemies and it's only right that it made its return here. Only problem is, it doesn't feel as satisfying in this game as it did before for a couple of important reasons. First of all, the developers must have realised that if they toned down the dark aesthetic they originally had planned for the game, then it was only wise to tone down the notoriously violent combat system as well. I can easily understand the reasoning behind this, but it just sucks a great deal of fun out of slaughtering enemies in the coolest way possible. A couple of the most brutal combat moves such as choking and slicing enemies in half have been removed altogether and the other finishers just don't pack the same punch anymore either. The creatures no longer scream in pain, heads no longer fly off and blood doesn't spew out of them when they're taken down. I get that this all seems like relatively trivial stuff as an impressive combat system still remains but trust me, it makes a big difference. The second reason is simply because the sand creatures you face off against are much trickier to defeat. The monsters in the island of time regularly proved a challenge but they always gave you ample room to start off a combo and take a handful of them out at once. You'd be the luckiest person alive if you can get a chance to do that in the two thrones. Your adversaries are constantly blocking all of your combos and seem much more aggressive in their fighting style. Just about all the enemies you come up against here seem extremely humanoid in appearance once again, and range from the rather mundane Scythian guards and archers, to creepy dark reptus creatures who can't stand the light, and female enchantresses who dance their way out of harm. There's quite a few different enemy types thrown in here which is always good to see, but no real difficulty curve to them. This time just about all the enemy encounters usually end up being a pain in the arse and costing you a huge chunk of your health bar. 
Worst of all are the new four-legged beasts called Hunter Hounds, which appear out of nowhere and suck all your sand tanks away before you can put them out of their misery. Ah, nah, I don't approve of these greedy bastards at all. Luckily, the combat isn't just as straightforward as some harder enemy types in a toned down freeform system. The game's saving grace once again is the Dark Prince and his legendary dagger tail weapon. I'm not going to lie, most of the combos with the Dark Prince slowly transform into some form of button mashing to see what sticks, but just about everything does stick. Enemies don't have a hope in hell of avoiding this weapon, as it's far more effective than the Dagger of Time. The Prince will swing and whip the weapon in just about every direction, pull enemies towards him, circle it above his head to buy him time, and stealthily strangle his victims to death. It feels endlessly more powerful wielding this unique weapon, but the good thing is, if you're not a fan of this more visceral fighting style, you can still utilise the Dagger of Time as a primary weapon. One huge gameplay inclusion which made its debut here was the introduction of stealth speed kills. Essentially, these are short quick time events which require you to press the action button just as the dagger illuminates in order to take down one or two enemies in quick succession. A lot of people seem to have a problem with this new mechanic, but I thought it was a neat addition that meant you could skip over some fighting sections and get straight to the next round of platforming. I get that it can be a bit overpowered at times, but it's routinely fun to see if you can silently take down a whole bunch of monsters instead of getting involved in an all out brawl. A lot of the environments above the creatures are cleverly set out for you to test the waters with this new mechanic and get into the perfect position to launch an attack. The best thing again is, you don't need to abide by them. If you want to just get torn into endless hordes of sandy bastards then you can drop down in amongst them at any point and go out all guns blazing. I do this myself from time to time, but ultimately I do find speed kills to be a handy tool to have at your disposal. Ok, so onto the action platforming now, and I'll just get stuck into all the new environmental additions we have here, because there certainly are a fair share of them. The platforming mechanics themselves are honestly still bloody outstanding, even 3 games in, or heck, even in 2020, nothing at all feels dated about the boundless control we have over the Prince. He still has his vast bundle of moves that we've gotten so used to over the past couple of outings, as well as his crucial sand powers, but this time round, they really went all out in trying to maximise the Prince's agile skills by introducing many new areas elements of the environment that the prince and his alter ego can interact with. We now have dagger grates, diagonal rebounds, dagger switches, mountable chains, close walls and vertical poles to chain across. I'm sure I've probably missed something else there that was introduced, but as you can tell, even by those that I've managed to recall, there's quite a lot of new stuff here to help you traverse each locale. Honestly, I love every one of these new additions, bar the dagger grate, which I think is simply overused throughout the entirety of the game. The diagonal rebound is my favourite, as it looks so effortlessly cool, springboarding from one ledge to another in a split second, and even bouncing right across rooms in brief occasions. Not quite sure that the physics of these devices hold up very well, but they keep the pace of the gameplay up no end. I'd say this game's slightly easier than Moria within in terms of platforming, since each place usually does just consist of you finding a way down to the ground for a fight with the sand monsters. Half the time the only real peril you face is falling to your death, as the usual corridors of traps and deadly devices don't make nearly as many appearances as before. Don't get me wrong, when they do litter the hallways, they honestly consist of the best layouts of the whole series, with an all new circular saw weapon that causes all sorts of problems. I just wish we had more demanding areas filled with these booby traps instead of empty streets and rooftops for half the game. Moving on now, we have what seems to be the most polarising new addition to the game, in the form of sporadic chariot courses that have you taking the reins of some horses and racing through the plundered streets of Babylon. These predominantly play out like short Hollywoodized segments that briefly freshen up the gameplay and get the prince from A to B in no time at all. I'm a huge fan of these chariot chases quite honestly, a guilty pleasure I suppose. They only crop up twice, so never get overbearing, and the controls handle accurately for the most part. It's not just a simple street sprint though, as you carefully navigate the terrain, battle against sand chariots and kill enemies that dive onto your vehicle. It's all harmless fun, and takes you through some wonderful diverse scenery, adding even more scope and scale to the city. My only gripe is that I maybe wish they'd set one of these courses at night or something, to help differentiate between the two segments, as they do feel remarkably similar to each other, aside from the length. Apart from the chariots, there's also a brief mini boss fight against a moat monster that finishes with you riding on the creature's back and controlling them all through the compact canals. Again, I'm a big fan. As always, I've saved the best till last, as we have to discuss the single biggest gameplay overhaul in the two thrones, the Dark Prince portions. Our prince transforms into his corrupted alter ego a good dozen times or so throughout the story, and in doing so, unleashes his untapped potential in terms of combat and platforming. I've already spoken about the plethora of great new moves that the Dark Prince can perform with the Dagger Tail while he's amidst a group of sand creatures, but this embedded weapon also increases the Prince's reaching range dramatically when platforming. 
He can now hook the dagger tail onto poles and lamps that jut out from the wall in order to gain more momentum in his course of action. As well as that, the tail can also be utilised to pull out cement coloured switches which open nearby doors. These unique environmental components only appear in the Dark Prince section of gameplay, meaning that he can use his unique powers to surpass otherwise impossible parts of the landscape. Aside from the welcoming new gameplay mechanics, we also get an entirely new look for our protagonist when the transformation takes place. His physical appearance is altered drastically as he now sports abnormally long flowing hair and a black colour scheme with sand trails flowing all through his body. I don't know if it was intentional, but his look always reminds me of volcanic rock with molten lava running through it. Sounds daft and all, but given the fact that they had the prince have to consciously burn himself in order to change into his darker side in the early Kindred Blades gameplay, it maybe holds some credence. Like the Sandwraith section in Warrior Within, our life fades away as we play as the Dark Prince, although this time at a much faster rate. The life bar present in this game is a fair bit shorter to begin with, so when it starts depleting, it becomes a true race against the clock as you traverse each level. Thankfully, your health can be fully regenerated by obtaining the Sands of Time, which are again held within breakable objects in the foes you take down. The crucial difference this time is that the life bar mercilessly empties entirely, meaning you'll perish within a minute or so if you don't seek out sand. Even though breakable objects are plentiful through most of the Dark Prince sections, it can become really troublesome to make it through trap riddled portions later in the game on low health. And to add salt to the wound, your sand tanks don't refill in this form either, so you need to spare every last rewind in your reserves. The Dark Prince is undoubtedly my favourite addition to the game. His potions always seem to enhance all elements of the gameplay and force you to change your playing style if you want to make it through these without continually slumping to your death. In terms of puzzle solving, it's much the same story as we've had with the last two outings, although there does seem to be a good deal more pressure plate pushing and lever pulling this time round to open every single door. Quite honestly, these can get a bit tiresome as they're probably the most time consuming action that the Prince can perform. On the other side of things, the puzzle solving platforming elements are better than ever, as you have to use every single little environmental aid to time your descent perfectly in each and every location. There is one main puzzle in the game though, where you have to gradually rotate a giant statue of your father through a royal workshop, eventually getting it to crash through a wall so you can make your escape. I despise this fucking shamble of a puzzle in its entirety. It completely kills the pace of the game as you keep making your way up and down ladders to two opposite platforms which control the statue. Even when you finally found out which way you need to turn the bastard to get it moving, it takes minutes on end to actually cross over and crank four separate levers this way and that. For me, it's the worst puzzle in the trilogy and laborious to work through. I'm always so glad when an exciting chariot chase kicks into gear straight after this slog. Truthfully, the level design in this game is a right mixed bag. Some areas feature platforming designs that are just off the charts in terms of enjoyment, but others have you just traipsing through cramped and rather lifeless sections of the city. It's a bit disappointing that they completely get rid of the open world idea from Warrior Within. That game was still linear with its gameplay, but at least it let you decide which tasks to complete first at times, or if you wanted to return to a certain area if you felt you missed something. I moaned about the excessive backtracking present in Island of Time, but honestly, that was a pretty small price to pay when the whole experience felt so seamlessly interconnected. It did feel like you had the whole island to explore at your own pace, even though that wasn't necessarily true. Here, in Two Thrones, we're on rails for the entire journey. There's no choice in the player's part, no separate paths to take and multiple endings to discover. It's all an intensely linear process. Don't get me wrong, Sands of Time was the same in this regard, but I think after we get the taste for some non-linear levels in the Island of Time, it just seemed a bit cheap to throw all that out the window and return to a complete beeline design. Let me be clear, I'm not looking for any real resemblance of an Assassin's Creed open style world here, but any essence of freedom would be greatly appreciated throughout the journey. Most of the early levels have a rather rinse and repeat feel to them, where you appear at the top of a surprisingly cramped open area and have to work in traversing your way down to the bottom, where a showdown awaits you as you fight the closed sand portal spread all over the city. There's not much diversity throughout these levels, and it feels like the game's an autopilot for large chunks. We eventually start receiving assistance from Farah, which helps freshen things up a great deal. But even in. We aren't receiving many new objectives as the game wears on, it's just we need to find and kill the vizier from beginning to end. It just so happens though that these rather dreary areas are balanced out perfectly as we are also treated to some of the most complex impressive levels in the whole series. The design and craftsmanship put into some of the better locales in the game honestly rinse away the sour taste from before as we must navigate our way through an artsy array of captivating vistas from time to time. 
Like always, I'll go over a few of my favourite levels in the game, and actually, this time round there was too many to choose from, so I just picked out a few that possessed the most uniqueness and switched up the gameplay the most efficiently. Early in the game we fall into the sewers and come to realise exactly what the Sands of Time have done to us. This creepy network of slippery walkways and marvellous platforming resources is the perfect place for the Dark Prince to come out and play. Being sandwiched in amongst many hours of meandering through streets and palaces also helps this sinister, eerie environment to stand out. Another great area that separates long city roaming segments is the brothel. This is a phenomenal change of pace as we gallivant through this alluring architecture that brings back pleasant memories of the bathhouses from Sands of Time. This portion of the game looks wildly different from many others and concludes with one of the neatest looking trap ridden corridors of them all. My favourite level in the game however is without doubt the Well of Ancestors. This mystical well shines with blue flickers of light and is designed beyond perfection to allow you to harness all the momentum possible when using the Dark Prince's dagger tail to suckle your way down. It contains such intriguing ominous scenery and again is infested with a multitude of challenging corridors all laid out to stop you in your tracks. You also get your reward at the end of this challenging section in the form of your father's glowing sword which can once again one hit kill all enemies. I've just noticed that the three specific levels I happen to have picked out all include lengthy Dark Prince gameplay. They really did just elevate certain parts of the two thrones to another level. One quick thing of note that's an extreme disappointment is the severe lack of secrets to be discovered throughout the city. There's six life upgrades and a few measly chests containing sand tokens for artwork and that's it. There's very little to go hunting for off the beaten track in this adventure, and the life upgrades we do come across are irregular to say the least. No longer do we have to shatter cracked walls or venture through long hidden passages overrun with traps, instead we just advance through ambiguous side routes and come across a rather ugly looking magic drinking fountain. Then we have to go through a random test of sorts to get the upgrade itself and then backtrack the way we came. It just feels odd and I wish they'd have kept the setup from Moria within, cause that made much more sense than this. To conclude this review, let's go over the boss fights, of which there are four of yet again. I know myself, I've probably given this game a great deal of unexpected flack for the last half hour, but we'll end on a true high note as the boss battles in the two thrones are unarguably the greatest of the trilogy, by far. Got another simple combat oriented face offs, this time round we must use a great deal of environmental and stealth mechanics to our advantage as we platform around each adversary. The bosses we faced were all former generals of the vizier, so it makes sense to take them down one by one before finally making your way up to the vizier himself. The first boss fight in the arena is perhaps the greatest of them all, even if it is just because your opponent is a 60 foot jawless goliath who kicks and swipes at you constantly. It's probably the most memorable moment of the game as you stab his eyes and he's fumbling around blind, kicking thin air. The second boss is an incredibly agile and unpredictable female opponent called Mahasti. Mahasti? Mahasti? I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that to be honest. Anyway, she can only be taken out by slowing down time and relentlessly slashing her with the dagger tail. This fight is definitely the weakest of the bunch as it consists of repeating the same move over and over, but it's still preferable over a simple round of combat. Then we come across the twin warriors who wield an axe and sword respectively and gang up on the prince after surrounding him in a ring of fire. This is arguably the hardest battle of the trilogy as the only possible way to defeat them is by focusing solely on the sword wielding twin until the other cleaves his axe into the ground, leaving him open to an attack. Eventually you'll get the chance to speed kill them, but if you finish the chariot section beforehand with no sand tanks remaining, then it's going to be one hell of a challenge for you. The final battle has you face off against the mighty half crab, half butterfly himself. This battle is a hundred times better than that damp squib we were unfortunately graced with at the end of Sands of Time. Here, the finale is lengthy, as his fight is conveniently split up into three different sections. First, we simply swipe at him and dodge his attacks. Then we have to avoid suckling rocks while attempting to launch a stealth kill on the ever moving vizier. And finally we have to platform up and across the cleverly arranged mass of rubble before plunging the dagger of time into his evil bastard and heart. Each boss fight here truly stands out and unexpectedly turn out to be a few of the real highlights within this adventure. Who'd have thought that when two games ago they were hardly even worth mentioning? Ok, so I think it's clear to everyone that I've pointed out a great deal more negatives with this instalment than I did with the previous two combined, and yeah, the Two Thrones does have a handful of issues which hold it back from being an all round outstanding game, but I'm still hugely fond of it despite of this. It's clear that the developers weren't quite sure what they wanted this game to be, so it takes a lighter tone and elegant setting from Sands of Time and mixes it in with the extreme violence and darker visuals from Warrior Within. 
even her original voice actor is back as the prince and I think that was a masterful decision in helping bring back the affectionate charm from before. I do not like pomegranates. What is wrong with you? They are messy, impossible to eat with dignity. But a part of me does often wonder how dark the story could have gotten had we seen the exact same prince return from the island of time, voice actor and all, and promoting the dark prince up to be the main antagonist for the game instead of the vizier. After all, I can't help thinking this is what they originally had in mind, given the shadowy teaser of him at the end of Warrior Within. Anyway, all that aside, this is still a legitimately thrilling final chapter to this epic trilogy, and every instalment stands the test of time admirably. I would say that the Two Thrones is my least favourite out of the three, but it's still a great experience that I return to often and would wholeheartedly recommend to any gamers out there. It's maybe not the conclusion we expected, but it's a commendable closure to the series no doubt, and sporadically does offer up the very best from both our previous adventures. Thank you very much for watching this review, especially if you sat through the full thing or watched any of the previous two videos as well, it's been great fun making the three of these. Don't forget to please like and share the video if you enjoyed what you've seen, and subscribe to the channel for loads more reviews on their way in the near future. Thanks again.